years now. Um, we do five of these uh, uh, weeks a year. Uh, so I'm pretty close to 60 of these myself, but this is the first time I've ever done uh, a virtual summit or a virtual presentation. And I like my presentations to be as interactive as possible. Uh, so there's going to be room for questions. Uh, Tracy's mod, Dr. Straup is moder moderating and monitoring this presentation. So if you raise your hand, she'll get to you and we'll make this more of a conversation than a, um, a lecture, I hope. Um, the Weiner Wellness Center is actually a physical location. I know that many of you who are tuning in or are viewing the broadcast have been here uh, as customers, as patients, as part of our, um, part of our community. Uh, for those of you who are just getting a sense of who we are and what we're about and what we do, um, we're located in the southernmost part of Pittsburgh, maybe the first suburb on the south side of Pittsburgh, uh, conveniently located between two major highways, 376 and, and I-79. Uh, so we're really, we're really very fortunate in terms of our location as to uh, how accessible we are to so many people in the metropolitan Pittsburgh area as well as parts of West Virginia and parts of Ohio. So this is, uh, as I said, this is uncharted territory. We're all online. I'm used to doing this presentation live and in person. And when we have uh, a group, we start off with a little conversation. And I know that everybody's present uh, because they wanna be healthier, because they want to um, enjoy better health, and the place where I like to begin my talk is, what, what does that mean? And people raise their hands and they uh, join in the conversation and we talk about uh, uh, strategies to be healthier, but I don't think that anybody's really done a very good job of just defining the word health. What, what, what would it mean to be a healthier person? And, and my answer to that question is having the ability to recognize interact with, adapt to, and overcome your environment, both internally and externally. So we're gonna recognize what's going on in our world internally, recognize what's going on in our world externally on the outside, and we're gonna to adapt to whatever it is that's going on and we're gonna overcome it. And that's what it means to be healthy. So if you look at our internal environment, that's, uh, that's our neurochemistry. That's the way our brain and our body are communicating with one another through uh, chemical means, through sending messages. If, if I wanna wiggle my fingers, if I wanna wave to my crowd and say hi, uh, I'm generating a plan in my brain. I'm, I'm coming up with an idea. I'm gonna, I'm gonna pick my arm up, I'm gonna move my hand around, and, and I'm gonna give you guys a very friendly greeting. So my brain is gonna come up with a plan and then part of my brain is gonna send, the part of my brain that came up with that plan is gonna send the message to a different part of my brain. And then my next part of my brain are gonna send messages through my spinal cord, out through my peripheral nerves, communicating with muscles down the length of my arm. And I'm gonna pick my fingers up and I'm gonna to wave to you. So far so good? So anyhow, this is my internal environment. My internal environment is also, uh, what have I eaten recently? Uh, how is my digestion occurring? How am I absorbing my nutrients? How am I gonna take those nutrients and disperse them throughout my body so that uh, um, all of my organ systems, my muscles, uh, um, my, my parts are gonna receive the nutrients, the nutrients that they specifically require. So that's what's going on inside. That's internal chemistry. External environment. Um, well, we all know or we have an idea of what's going on in the world uh, right now. You can see I'm, I'm not wearing my mask because I'm alone in my office communicating with the, all of you, but I have my mask here uh, just hanging around my neck. Uh, I believe that having the mask is just a, it's a sign of respect. I'm wearing, I'm wearing my mask in effort to protect everybody around me from whatever kind of uh, um, uh, debris comes out as I'm breathing. Uh, the little particles that come out as we exhale. I, I don't want anybody to catch whatever it is that I'm, I'm projecting outwards. So I have a mask for it. And hopefully uh, everybody else who's going out and who's socializing and, and 
getting out of their house or getting into a, uh, an environment that's shared by other people. We all respect each other. We don't want to, we don't want to uh, contaminate one another's environment. So we wear a mask. That's external stuff, recognizing what's going on, adapting to it and overcoming. If you go out to Giant Eagle or whatever supermarket you frequent and almost everybody's wearing a mask and there's one person who's not and they're coughing and sneezing profusely, what are you going to do? You're going to step away from them. You're going to get as far away from that person as possible. That's our external environment that we're recognizing, adapting to, and we're going to overcome it as a sign of good health and move away from a perceived threat. So far, so good. Tracy, any questions about this so far? Nope, we're doing great. You got a little okay. crowd going on here and they are waiting for more. <laughs> okay, good, good. So this conversation topic or this lecture is supposed to be about your brain on chiropractic. So that would mean how does chiropractic affect your nervous system? How does it affect your brain? And ultimately, how will chiropractic adjustments be able to affect your whole body? So as I mentioned, I've been practicing here at the Weiner Wellness Center for uh, more than 12 years, almost 13. Uh, my, my Weiner Wellness Center bar mitzvah is coming up. Um, before that, I practiced in uh, New York City. I practiced in um, metropolitan Washington, D.C. and Alexandria, Virginia. Uh, I went to school and I trained in Kansas City. I've gone to workshops in a, uh, um, a number of different cities and interacted throughout the country. And I've interacted with a number of different chiropractors who practice in other locations. Uh, I've had the opportunity to practice in uh, Jamaica in the West Indies. And I'm here to tell you something remarkable. People really aren't that different in all of these places. I mean, we all have our subtle internal chemical differences where one person might be allergic to one thing, somebody else might be allergic to something else. One person might be taller than another person, another person has a more athletic build. Once you get past that, our chemistry and our internal mechanisms and the way uh, our bodies move and the way we can challenge our bodies to move are remarkably similar from uh, one to another throughout the world. So I'm speaking on very generalized terms of what I've experienced and at the same time very specific of what applies to human beings. So as I mentioned, I practice chiropractic. I do hands-on adjustments and manipulations to the spine, to the extremities. Uh, I teach low-tech rehab exercises. Low-tech rehab exercises means that we are not using equipment. We're using our bodies in the way we move and the way we stretch. Uh, we might use a wall to push up against. Uh, we might use a, a, a very, very sophisticated device such as a shower towel for certain exercises. I favor teaching people, my patient population, low-tech things that you can, ways that you can move your body to uh, help accelerate your rehabilitation and to accelerate recovery from your collection of symptoms. I do a little bit of, of muscle release technique uh, meaning that a form of muscle therapy, getting uh, muscles to stretch beyond their normal range of motion, uh, getting tight spasm trigger points to release. And of course, I do uh, recommend nutritional supplements that reinforce the conditions and the improvement of the uh, symptomatology for the patients as, uh, um, as I see them. So that's, that's what I do here. I'm joined by uh, a great team. Uh, we have Adam who does muscle therapy uh, exclusively, and he works one-on-one -on -one with people to help get rid of muscle spasms and to um, uh, lengthen tight muscles. I work with Dr. Honigman, who also does hands-on chiropractic and a lot more nutrition than I do, and some lifestyle coaching. And I work with Jeffrey Nisnik, who also does uh, nutritional consultations and even some allergy elimination, allergy reversal work. So that's, that's our team. And I'd like to speak uh, specifically about what's going on chemically, uh, neurologically, when the patient receives treatment. But before I do that, I wanna tell you, I'm a, I'm a lucky guy. I have a number of interests and I have a, a number of topics and I'm invited to speak in uh, different locations and to different venues about uh, other topics, in, some in healthcare, some not. And one thing I like to do in all my lectures when I'm interacting with the public is we want to work on some deep breathing exercises. And when we talk about low-tech rehab, um, this is the place to begin. 
so many of us work at a desk all day long and we find ourselves in this head forward posture leaning into our computers some of us adopt the same posture as we're driving and our jobs or our activities are behind the steering wheel and we just kind of lean into it um, some of us uh, spend way too much time in front of the tv uh, when we eat we find ourselves leaning forward and that's a that leads to a very specific postural distortion, which we're gonna get more into as the uh, conversation ensues here. Uh, but what happens is, if you could just bring your head as far forward, like you're leaning into the computer for a second and take a deep breath, you'll find that it's really very shallow. Whereas when you sit back up straight and tall, exhibiting good chiropractic posture, and you take that same deep breath, you're able to inhale much further and much deeper. So I think you can see right off the bat how important posture is in terms of uh, global health, the ability to uh, uh, overcome your environment because we're just simply able to breathe deeper. So what I'd like to do is very quickly work on a deep breathing exercise. And what we're all gonna do is we're gonna sit up as straight and tall as we possibly can. Um, I can't see you guys. I hope you guys can all see me, uh, but we're, sitting straight and tall at our, at our chairs, at our sofas, in front of our computer, wherever we may be. Um, and what I want you guys to think about doing is inhaling through your nose and exhaling through your mouth. But instead of taking that deep breath and allowing your shoulders to drift up as you inhale, I want your shoulders to drift backwards. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna inhale through our, through our noses and we're gonna very gently squeeze our shoulder blades together behind our back as we're inhaling. And what that's gonna do is it's gonna lift our chest cavity and prevent our shoulders from rolling forward or lurching forward, uh, um, leaving these muscles uh, in the front of your neck, preventing them from acting as a pulley system, lifting your rib cage up into the air. Uh, and instead, we're gonna exercise our diaphragms to be able to breathe deeply from uh, the bottom fields of our lungs. So let's do that. Let's inhale through our noses. We're gonna have our chests lifted up without our shoulders elevated. We're holding the breath in our lung fields for 1,001, 1,002, 1,003, and let's blow out through our mouths. And as we blow out through our mouths, our torso starts to sink in and relax. Let's do that again. Big deep breath in through your nose. Our torsos are expanding, our shoulders are not shrugging up, but our chests are getting big, our torsos and our lungs are being filled with delicious oxygen, and now we're gonna blow out through our mouths and relax. So, I, I regret not being able to have one-on-one -on -one interaction with everybody within the group as we're doing this drill and being able to survey the crowd and say after two, even three deep breaths, some people start to feel lightheaded. Some people start to feel pinching between their shoulder blades or in their spine, in any area of their spine. Um, they struggle to be able to, um, to be able to hold their posture up in an upright uh, position as they're doing that deep breathing. And we start to see a fatigue. Those are all signs of shallow breathing. So what we want to do is influence all of you who are listening in, just as I influence my patients to do this uh, with uh, our appointment visits, is we want to become deep, relaxed breathers. We want to get as much delicious oxygen into our bodies as possible. We want to be able to assimilate that oxygen and move it around through our circulatory system so our whole bodies uh, can derive that physical benefit. So far, so good? So Good. Let's talk about chiropractic adjustments uh, um, and uh, make this time really count. And hopefully uh, after um, I speak about this a little bit, you guys will all, for those of you who have chiropractors, you'll go rushing out to see your chiropractor. Uh, if you don't have a chiropractor and you're in the Pittsburgh area uh, at the Weiner Wellness Center, we're accepting new patients. Uh, we're not this week because we're so invested in our nutritional sales and all hands are on deck to take care of uh, the supplement orders and to get the shipping out. And so we closed our doors for patients for the week to emphasize the other aspect of our business. But we will be starting to see new patients uh, as early as next week. But anyhow, 
let's say, let's say I talk about our typical chiropractic patient who comes to see their chiropractor, hopefully me, with physical aches and pains. There's something physically wrong with their body to the extent that they feel themselves in a state of discomfort. Maybe their ranges of motion are limited. Uh, maybe they're just uh, um, generally achy. Uh, maybe it's because they've exerted themselves in a physical way and they fatigue their body doing exercise or yard work or uh, cleaning the basement. Or maybe they don't even know. Maybe this is just build up over time and then the patient can't isolate a single particular event that caused them to experience this kind of uh, physical dis discomfort. We can't take a better detective than me to figure out what happened, but it happens. So a patient comes in hurting. We take a multimodal uh, approach to what's going on with that particular patient. And if you could imagine, uh, if I take a string of dental floss and I tie a knot in that dental floss and I slip it between my bottom two front teeth and somebody standing on front, in front of me will grab the distant end of the dental floss and they'll pull. So the bottom part, my chin and the bottom part of my jaw are going to start to translate forward. And they're going to come to a point where these very small muscles that allow me to chew start to uh, start recruited to do something that they're capable of doing, but they're not supposed to do. And that is they're going to pull backwards. So now we have this elaborate game of tug of war where somebody is using a piece of dental floss locked into my bottom teeth pulling my mouth forward and my very small stabilizing and chewing muscles are pulling backwards. So what's going to happen is I, I don't think that anyone is going to be able to pull out my bottom teeth with this uh, maneuver. And I don't think that anybody is just going to dislocate my jaw, both theoretically possible, but I don't see it happening. What is going to happen is I'm going to start to build up a lot of inflammation uh, uh, in this area of my jaw, in this area of my face. I'm going to start to lose range of motion uh, um, at that hinge of my jaw, uh, and it's going to hurt. I'm going to start to have uh, uh, pain, discomfort around my temples, around my eyes, and my jaw. Chewing is going to hurt. Uh, um, my face is going to hurt, and we're going to have to do something about it. Now, when we have this scenario, we got to do three things. First of all, we got to get rid of the inflammation. All of this inflammation has built up in this area of my anatomy of my body. And we recommend nutritional supplementation to get rid of uh, uh, the inflammation. I'm, I'm partial to turmeric. Uh, nutritional Frontiers puts out um, a product called X-Flame, which contains a number of anti-inflammatory nutrients that uh, include the turmeric. Um, we can make a whole list of all the, uh, of all the anti-inflammatory nutritional supplements, but over the course of the week, we're going to have 20 ish presentations and all the round tables. I want to take what time I have to talk about physical treatment. The second thing that we have to do is repair the mechanics of the hinge of the jaw. Somehow, some way we've gotten rid of the inflammation in the hinge of the jaw. Now we got to manipulate it and adjust it and coax it. And, and get these small stabilizing muscles to come out of spasm. And, and we got to restore normal ranges of motion to the hinge of the jaw. The third thing that has to happen is we have to get whoever it is that's pulling on that dental floss from the other end to quit. As long as somebody's pulling on the dental floss, we're caught in a cycle. We got this feed forward mechanism where the problem just continue, the problems just continue to persist. And we might do all the proper nutritional supplementation. We might do a magnificent job repairing the mechanics of the hinge of the jaw, but we're gonna keep doing the same things over and over again because the, the pulling has never been uh, uh, let go. So far, so good. So anyhow, muscles, tendons, and the skeleton behave the same way. Muscles will tighten or they'll spasm. Maybe it's in a response to a direct injury. Maybe it's an indirect injury. Maybe it's repetitive motion. Maybe it's buildup over time. Uh, it can be traumatic. It can be non-traumatic. The muscle has spasmed. It's tightening. It's moving in a direction that's uh, against what we want. It's disadvantageous. 
the distant end of the muscle is going to attach to a tendon. And the tendon is a lot like the dental floss. It's a fixed length. No matter how hard you pull on that tendon, it's not going to stretch. It's going to swell and it's going to inflame and it's going to become irritated, but it won't stretch to accommodate for that muscle that has uh, um, shortened and spasmed and moved disadvantageously. The far end of the tendon is going to attach to the skeleton, to, uh, um, to bones. And as the talent tendon and the muscle complex exert a greater force onto the skeleton, those bones, where bones come together, we have joints. Those joints start to compress with one another. We start to see more inflammation, more swelling. We start to see irritation of uh, connective tissue. We see a loss of range of motion. And most importantly, we see a change and how do those joints and how do that, that, uh, that area of the body communicate with the brain? So the joints living in between bones, we have very specialized neurological tissue called receptors. There are different types of receptors throughout the body. Uh, each one has a specialized task, but the receptor's job is to receive information and to transmit that information into the nervous system, to the spinal cord, and to deliver messages to the brain. So receptors that live uh, uh, in joints have a push-pull relationship. One goes up, one goes down with the types of receptors in the body that will tell the brain that we're in pain. They also signal into areas of the brain that are very well intimate, intimately related with balance, our ability to orient our bodies in space, to know where we are, to, uh, um, to inhibit our sympathetic nervous system and allow our parasympathetic nervous system to thrive. Sympathetic nervous system and parasympathetic nervous system, big important words, and we're gonna come right back to that in uh, uh, just a moment. So here we are in this state of muscle spasm, uh, increased torque, heavy pressure, inflammation of tendons, joints not moving through their ranges of motion, uh, not able to achieve their function, sending information into the brain that signals we're in pain, and at the same time preventing signaling into the nervous system in the brain that we're able to uh, um, orient our bodies in space, we're able to uh, move comfortably and not awkwardly, uh, we should uh, um, we should have better balance and our body should calm down out of a fight or flight mechanism. So far so good? So anyhow, I'm gonna keep you in suspense for a moment about what we're gonna do about this and let's take a couple more deep breaths. Once again, let's have everybody sit up straight and tall and we're gonna inhale through our noses and at the same time, allowing our chest cavities to drift forward, our shoulder blades to rock backwards and down behind our backs and not allowing our shoulders to shrug. So big deep breath in through your nose and we're holding it. 1,001, 1,002, 1,003 and blow out through your mouths and relax. Again, big deep breath in through your nose our chest cavities are expanding. We're sucking in all that delicious oxygen. It's spread, it, the oxygen is spreading around throughout our body, nourishing all of our cells and blow out through our mouths. We good? All right. So we're trapped in this scenario where we have this brain body disconnect. We're feeling pain, discomfort, awkwardness, uh, um, maybe our, our movements feel ratchety or incomplete. Uh, we feel like our balance might be off. If not our balance, certainly our ability to know where we are in space and to move comfortably. And we've gone to see a chiropractor. So after we've had a thorough conversation and an exam to rule out uh, uh, red flags, I mean, if somebody presents with a medical emergency, just, just this morning, we had a, a patient who came to pick up her nutritional supplements who was 
saying that she had a 70% um, a carotid artery block and was looking to solicit more information as to what to do. Uh, the carotid artery is one of the major arteries that runs through the neck, bringing blood to the brain. A 70 cent, a 70 percent blockage is that's a that's a potential problem. Uh, we instructed her to keep in touch with her medical doctor, who was uh, examining her and monitoring her situation, and we can't let that get out of hand. Um, so we have to make a determination. We have to examine people and talk to people and get a global sense that they have no red flags. There's no emergency situation. We can proceed with uh, conservative treatment. That being said, we're talking about our hypothetical patient who sits with their head into the computer, leaning forward all day at work. Uh, they have the kind of posture that somebody would exhibit if they have an uncomfortable chair they're unable to breathe as deeply as we just did a couple moments ago with the, uh, with the exercise. Our patient is leaning in, they have a little bit of uh, neck pain in the back, difficulty turning their head side to side, uh, the muscles in the front of their neck that act as a pulley system to lift the rib cage up in order to breathe deeply uh, are in spasm and they have headaches. This is one of the most common presentations that we see. This is, this is a classic chiropractic patient. This is somebody who uh, we see every day, at least once, and responds well to the type of care that we offer. So what are we gonna do? First of all, uh, we've, as I've mentioned, we've had a conversation, we've had an examination, we know that there's no sign of an internal bleed. We know that they have, uh, um, their brain body communication is dampened down because of their condition, but it's not uh, eliminated because of some sort of underlying uh, metabolic condition, we're proceeding. So first we have to make sure that we release the tension on the dental floss. That means that what we're going to do is we're gonna do muscle therapy, we're gonna do techniques to stretch tight muscles. That patient might see Adam, for uh, more comprehensive muscle therapy. Uh, I'm certainly gonna do some work to release tension in the muscles of their neck or Dr. Honigman will do the same thing if that's his patient. And we've, uh, um, we've started to stretch this person and in improve their range of motion this way. Um, the second thing we're gonna do is make chiropractic adjustments to the restricted joints of their neck and their upper back and their upper rib cage. Now, I've mentioned the term restricted joints. What that means is the joints are moving uh, uh, in a way that they shouldn't. They're, they have an incomplete range of motion. They are uh, tight and rigid. I never said anything about a bone being out of place or anything about a misalignment. If we were talking about bones being misaligned and bo bones being out of place, we would have to take x-rays and we would mark those x-rays up uh, um, and determine exactly where the misalignment might be. And then we would have a very long, long treatment plan uh, in order to make architectural changes to somebody's skeleton. A lot of chiropractors out there are practicing using that philosophy and that's, that's fine, it's, it's not wrong. It's just not how we do things here. We're much more interested in functional treatments and getting people to feel as good as possible as soon as possible using our, our comprehensive multi-anatomical tissue approach rather than uh, um, trying to change their architecture. We're trying to resynchronize the way their muscles and their skeleton work together, not realign their skeleton. That being said, we're gonna find the places in the body and the neck in this case and in the uh, um, upper back, the shoulders, the rib cage, that are gonna allow, uh, um, that we're gonna be able to adjust to allow for the greatest improvements in their patient's range of motion. When we make these chiropractic adjustments and these manipulations, what we start to do is excite that receptor population that's very specialized nervous tissue that responds to movement and responds to position in space uh, in the restricted joints, and that's gonna send signaling into the brain saying, hey, we're in movement. 
we're starting to uh, um, we're starting to come out of this restricted state. We're starting to be able to uh, turn our heads from side to side in the uh, fullest way. Um, we are uh, we're doing better now. So uh, um, anyhow, we have this uh, um, this range of motion increase. And what we do is we signaled the, uh, um, the specialized nervous tissue receptors to communicate with the brain that we're starting to improve better coordination. We're starting to be able to move uh, um, and through space in a way we're better to orient ourselves and we're better able to, to literally find our bodies in space. Very, very common follow-up comments from patients who are adjusted and they immediately say, I feel so much freer. I'm able to breathe so much deeper. So anyhow, we have this patient who's, uh, um, who now has this barrage of neurological input into their brain. And one of the areas of the brain that's very well influenced by chiropractic care is called the cerebellum. The cerebellum fires to allow for coordinated movement to allow uh, our bodies to uh, um, move as a unit rather than a collection of parts. For example, when you see somebody walk, when you're walking along, when you observe other people walking along, if they step forward with their right foot, they should be swinging their left arm forward. And when they step forward with the left, uh, um, the left foot or the left leg, we have the right arm swinging forward. This is called a cross crawl movement and it's a cerebellar function. So anyhow, we just made this adjustment. We increased people's ranges of motion. We've allowed them to orient their bodies better in space. We're improving their coordination. And another function, a very important function of the cerebellum is that it inhibits the sympathetic nervous system. I mentioned sympathetic and parasympathetic nervous system a few moments ago. And I promise to get back on to that. And I'm going to make good on that promise right now. If we think about all the activity that we're doing that we're capable of, of, of what goes on, we can subdivide our activities into two categories, voluntary and non-voluntary. If I ask you, as I said very earlier, go ahead and wave your hands. I'm waving to say hello and give you a polite, uh, uh, welcoming gesture. It's good to see you guys, even if I'm not seeing you here in the office. I made a plan in my brain. And then my brain sent messages to other parts of my brain uh, uh, saying, hey, let's enact this plan. And then those other parts of my brain told, uh, sent messages through my spinal cord that traveled all the way to my shoulder and my arm telling me to pick my arm up and wiggle my fingers. That was very much voluntary activity. I had complete control over that. And I can ask all of you people listening in to pick up your arms and just wave right now or not. You guys have control as to whether or not you want to do this. What if I said, what if I said, okay, I want everybody listening in to dilate their pupils. <laughs> Now we have a problem. You can't just dilate your pupils no matter how badly you want to, because I asked you to. This is non-voluntary activity. We need some sort of external stimulus to get our, uh, our pupils to dilate, correct? So anyhow, non-voluntary activity, our heart rate, our digestive tract, Non-voluntary activity is classified as what's called autonomic. So we have this autonomic nervous system that governs our non-voluntary activity and keeps us going. Our autonomic nervous system can be subdivided into two parts, our sympathetic nervous system and our parasympathetic nervous system. Our sympathetic nervous system can be thought of as our fight or flight mechanisms. When your sympathetic nervous system is overactive, we're going to have an elevated heart rate. We can have hypertension. We can have high blood pressure. Uh, we find ourselves sweating. We find ourselves muscle, our muscles tightening and spasming and becoming agitated. Um, and our parasympathetic is exactly the opposite. 
it's our calm down, wine, dine, and relax uh, modality in our nervous system. That's where our heart rate's restored to normal, our blood pressure calms down. Now you might ask, what's the advantage to having a sympathetic nervous system? That sounds awful, I don't want my heart rate to escape, I wanna be in a calm, relaxed state. I wanna be breathing deeply, not very shallow, practically hyperventilating. I, I don't wanna have hypertension. Nothing is all good, nothing is all bad. The, the sympathetic and the parasympathetic nervous system uh, fo function in tandem with one another. And our species survived all this time because we were so good at recognizing danger and getting out of the way and escaping from it. If we're driving along in our, uh, um, in our cars along the highway and we see somebody uh, um, who's driving erratically, if you look in your rear view mirror and you see that somebody is, is maybe coming so close to you and starting to tailgate you and you're in the left-hand lane driving a little bit slower than you really ought to in the left-hand lane, you know what? That's not a good time to, uh, to calm down and relax and drive slower. That's a time to say, I recognize what's going on here. Uh, this could be a danger. Let me move my car over to the left hand lane, over to the right hand lane, and allow this person to pass me. That's recognizing where you are in space. That's uh, adapting to your environment. That's your sympathetic nervous system telling you, let's get out of the way of danger and avert disaster. So anyhow, when we do chiropractic adjustments. One of the things that happens, one of the neurological phenomenon that happens is that our cerebellum starts to fire. And our cerebellum fi fires to inhibit the sympathetic nervous system and start to stimulate or allow the parasympathetic nervous system to take over. Why do we feel this feeling of, uh, why do we experience this feeling of relaxation after being adjusted by a chiropractor? Why are we able to move in a more fluid manner? Uh, why does our blood pressure come down? Why is our heart rate coming down? It's because our, our chiropractic adjustment stimulates the cerebellum to do its two main chores. One, to continue to uh, improve coordinated movement, coordinated function, to get the body to move the way it's supposed to as a, uh, a single unit rather than a collection of parts. Two, the cerebellum is going to start to fire to inhibit that sympathetic nervous system and allow us to be in a more parasympathetic, wine, dine, relaxed state. So far, so good? Tracy, am I, am I getting questions or can I keep rolling? You can keep going. There are a couple questions, but we'll wait unless okay. you want to answer a few. Well, what I, what I want to do is I want to touch on one more part of yeah. the cerebellar activity and then we'll, uh, we'll start opening the questions, okay? Sounds good. Okay, so the, um, the cerebellum is also the part of the brain that is most susceptible to uh, oxygen deprivation. So if we're, the, bo the body is smart. When you breathe in oxygen, the body is gonna prioritize who needs it the most and that's where it's gonna go. Brain is number one on the checklist. Um, Amongst neurological components, amongst the brain, the, um, the cerebellum is the most likely or the easy, easiest to be deprived oxygen and to go into oxygen deprivation state. So here's a little uh, life hack. Don't anybody, please, please, I'm not advocating for drinking and driving. Uh, uh, that's the last thing on my list. Don't, don't read too far into this, but if you look at what goes on with alcohol, we start depriving the, the body the ability to absorb oxygen. So if that happens, the cerebellum is the first part of the nervous system that will, uh, um, will suffer as a result. And we talked about already that the cerebellum, what happens? Without cerebellum, we lose coordinated movement. If you've ever uh, observed somebody who may have drank a little too much alcohol, they move in a staggered kind of ratchety way, arms flailing about, not really walking like uh, um, uh, swinging their opposite arm, opposite leg, more so plodding their way through space. 
they've lost that cerebellar body communication because they've deprived themselves so much oxygen. Next thing that happens, we've lost inhibition, we've, we've lost inhibition to the sympathetic nervous system. So that means maybe we get a little bit of a, a rowdiness, a little bit of body tightness and start to sweat a little bit when we're drunk and our heart rate goes up and we're uh, um, maybe even itching for a confrontation. So when you see a, uh, um, the police officers doing what are called field sobriety checks and testing drivers, they're really doing the same thing that a good neurologist would do to test a patient's cerebellar activity and checking on their coordinated movement function to determine if the cerebellum is being deprived or if it's being uh, allowed to function in the normal way that it should. So I said a moment ago, I certainly don't advocate for, uh, for drinking to excess, and I don't advocate for drinking and driving, and I'm actually very opposed to both of those things, but this is a very good real world context of display of cerebellum versus lack of cerebellum in action. So to summarize, what we do here at the Weiner Wellness Center is we repair the mechanics of the hinge of the jaw and allow the uh, um, all the related nervous tissue to do what it's supposed to do and allow it to um, signal to the brain where we are in space and we have good complete range of motion and we uh, um, uh, we can experience the neurological benefits of, of free ranges of motion. We get rid of the inflammation that builds up with the uh, with the injuries and we release the tension on the dental floss or a little bit more specifically, when we have patients who are injured, we use chiropractic care to include muscle therapy, uh, to include good sound nutrition, to reinforce our treatments, and to reinforce, uh, to use good low-tech exercises to reinforce our chiropractic visits. We even here online through the Zoom presentation, we're able to do some of our, our very foundational uh, low-tech exercise, which is the, the deep breathing, um, and getting people to relax the musculature of their neck, the top of their chest, and engage their diaphragms a little bit more to get as much oxygen into their bodies as possible with deep breath. So um, with that, Tracy, I'd like to, let's get started with some of these questions. Okay, so I'm just going to change our view. Okay. So hello. Right. Hi. Um, so there's a couple questions. One from Wendy. She says, after a nasty cold and then the flu in early March and a lot of coughing, I had four mm -hmm. ribs out of place. I get one to two adjustments a week, but they're still popping out of place. And I'm focusing on core exercises and it's getting better. But what can I do to help keep these ribs in place? Wendy, that's such a common presentation of people that we see uh, of uh, the rib mechanics failing after um, after uh, an injury or an illness or some sort of physical challenge to their body, and uh, I think you're I think you're right on point to um, to get yourself adjusted and to um, do the core strengthening exercises. The one thing I would add for you to do if you're not already doing it are the same deep breathing exercises that we've done very briefly here on this, um, on this uh, Zoom presentation. Uh, I want you to focus on inhaling through your nose, allowing your chest cavity to expand with each deep breath without allowing your shoulders to drift upwards, rather they drift backwards. And that's what that's going to do. And you hold that deep breath for a few seconds and then blow out through your mouth. And what that's really going to do is it's, if, if nothing else, that's going to strengthen your diaphragm muscle. And we want to think about the diaphragm muscle really as being a, a very important part of the core. And this is so often neglected that, that patients, exercisers will do planks and they'll do uh, um, balance exercises on a wobble board. Uh, and they'll do all, they'll strengthen and create flexibility in their psoas muscles, and they'll do work for their transversus abdominis, and they're doing excellent at what they're doing, but they're missing that one last ingredient, which is strength of the diaphragm, which really holds the whole tube together. So that would be, that would be my best recommendation as a place to start. Um, the second thing I might recommend for you is to, uh, to take DMG. That's one of the Nutritional Frontiers products 
that allows you to get more of your oxygen out of your lungs into your circulatory system. And, and that really, really accelerates healing for most injuries. Awesome. And then the next question is how can, can, excuse me, can chiropractic help with the anxiety people are feeling right now with the COVID-19? That's another super, super, super question. Um, yes, yes. Um, when I gave this presentation, we talked about hands-on chiropractic and the things that um, a chiropractor, specifically me, can do for you. <laughs> Um, later in the week, I'm going to be talking about things that you can do for yourself. So this is really a shameless plug for my talk on, I believe it'll be Wednesday, mm -hmm. but we're going to talk about, uh, uh we're going to talk a lot about anxiety and we're going to talk about, um, things that, uh, um, you can do for yourself to eliminate anxiety, to calm yourself down, uh, emotionally, spiritually, and physically. Um, and at the risk of sounding like a broken record and a one trick pony, I'm going to repeat back to you what I just told uh, Wendy and what we've done through all this, this lecture and that we want to do things, whether we're talking about the anxiety that exists with the, uh, the current, uh, current pandemic, or whether we're talking about the anxiety that really everybody faces in their everyday life, even before this uh, came to surface. What we want to do is we want to inhibit sympathetic nervous system. We want to stimulate parasympathetic nervous system. We want to just breathe deeply. And, and when you really think about it, if you're sitting in good posture and you're inhaling through your nose and you're holding that deep breath for a moment or two in time, and then you're exhaling through your mouth, that, that's a form of meditation. Mm -hmm. And um, I know, uh, um, I know there, are, there, are, there are a lot of right ways to meditate. And there are a lot of intimate relationships between meditation and prayer. And I certainly don't want to step on anybody's spiritual beliefs. And that's not what I'm here for. Uh, but if you find yourself, if you find yourself just breathing and relaxing and allowing your body to, to suck in that delicious oxygen and, and let that oxygen flow through you, uh, um, it's very relaxing. It's a very relaxing experience. And, and I'm talking about things that you can do for yourself. Mm -hmm. If you'd like to come in and be adjusted, I mean, we can talk about which specific adjustments are appropriate for you, not necessarily for knee pain or shoulder pain, but what can we do to uh, uh, think about how your body should move as you breathe and adjust you on those patterns. So yes, I'm, I, I believe that chiropractic can help you with your anxiety, but I believe that we can empower you to do things for yourself that'll be an even bigger help. Perfect. Well, thank you so much for your time. That was great. I've never really heard chiropractic explained that way, and I really enjoyed learning from you. So thank you so well, much. And, and first of all, thank you for putting this together. And, and second of all, I, I just, I wish I would have said this the first thing to come out of my mouth, but I'm humbled to follow Dr. Tenpenny. I mean, that was such a super presentation. And, and the fact that you got her to speak is a coup in and of itself. <laughs> and I'm, I'm grateful to everybody who paid attention to what it is that I have to say. Uh, I hope to see, I, I mean, I know that, I mean, I've been watching my cell phone sitting over here, not paying attention to it, but watching the text go off left and right of people who I know from far and wide who've tuned in. Um, I want a quick special shout out to Dr. Michael Harvey, who's tuned in from Jamaica, uh, the island, not Queens. Um, <laughs> um, I'm, I just, you know, I'm grateful to Dr. Weiner for putting all of this together in his lifetime and have the chance to be a part of it. And uh, I really, as Jamie and I spoke very briefly this morning, the people who practice here enjoy practice. We, yeah. we like, we feel privileged to have the opportunity to interact with others one-on-one -on -one to discuss their health and to do what we can to to help them with it. So, uh, I mean, if you're thanking me, believe me, I'm thanking you 10 times over. And for the people who are listening in and paying attention, I'm thanking you a hundred times over. Oh, well, you know, your passion and compassion shines through. So we really appreciate you. Right. Well, we're up for our next lecture. It's going to be Ron Lisey from Olympian Labs. And this video will be available on Facebook all day long. And Dr. Robach, you are accepting patients, correct? Yes, yes. not this week. But Not this life. week, but in general, so they need yes. to call, not 
412-922-WELL and get in your schedule because I know it fills up. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I've been lucky. I mean, I, I have true. great patients who, who send their friends and family and come back and say kind things about me. And uh, uh, they tell me I'm living up to my end of the deal. So I'm going to run with that. That's awesome. All right. Thanks All right. Again, well, thank you so much, guys.